So this morning, uh, before we start, uh, would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, we come before you this morning as people that need to hear from you. And God, we know that um, in your word are, are a lot of different things, lessons that you would have us to observe, um, things that we can take and, and apply to our lives, and, and also things that teach us about our need for a savior, the character of man, and, and your character, O oh Lord. So we just pray this morning as we start into our two-part um, sermon series regarding Samson and the life of Samson, God, that you would, you would just speak through um, the life lessons that we uh, observe as we're going through um, this two-part series. And I thank you for each person that's here and pray that you'd meet every need in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to be starting into this two-part series in the book of Judges. And, and we pick up, up after um, the Easter uh, celebrations that we've had, the Passover celebrations that we've had. And we're uh, picking back up into the book of Judges. And um, who here has read the book of Judges completely? Okay. There's a lot in there, isn't there? There's a lot of things that are disturbing, I guess you could say, too. So when you read Judges, a lot of things uh, come across your view, and you go, what is this? <laughs> and why is this? Well, within the saga of the book of Judges, you see, we see Israel continuing in a cyclical pattern of drifting away from loyalty to God and becoming enamored with the worship practices of the Canaanites in the land in which they had taken over. So they began to observe Canaanite rituals and their eyes were turned away from the Lord and instead of destroying the pagan altars that God had instructed them to destroy for their own good, in disobedience to the law of Moses, the Israelites began to worship them. And things would uh, not go well. Spiritual apostasy bore a very, very bitter fruit for those people. Disobedient and idolatrous Israel was frequently defeated by their enemies as a direct consequence of their rebellion against the Lord. And God's blessing and protection as a result of their actions was removed from them. Social chaos marked the period of the judges. And people were hiding in their homes, hiding in wine presses from the enemies that had invaded and taken over their lands. They were no longer safe to go out in public. But instead of turning to the Lord, they continued their path. They took the law into their own hands and immorality increased. But as they suffered the consequences of their disobedient actions... They cried out to the Lord for his deliverance. And time and time again, there would be this cycle. They'd cry out to the Lord for their deliverance, and the Lord would hear their cries. And he would send a judge to them to deliver them from their misery. And things would improve for a short time, but then when things got good, the people would wander away in their vision and look towards the idols again. And they begin to prost prostitute themselves to other gods, the gods of the Canaanites. And it was a horrific pattern that continually got worse. And it, it was spinning in a cycle down further and further and further. And we see in the scriptures actually how it ended up resulting, this pattern kept going, and it ended up resulting in, in Israel 
being removed. The Bible says they were vomited out of the land and sent into captivity, into Babylonian captivity and Assyrian captivity. Isaiah the prophet said it very well from God's perspective. In Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 to 4, we read, God said this to the Israelites, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here I am, here I am. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick. And such was the case with Israel in the time of Samson. We see a very clear revelation of the character of God, but also the character of men when we look at this story. And Judges 17.6 tells us this, that in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And believe me, when everybody as sinners, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, when everybody as sinners does what is right in their own eyes, the result is terrible, and it's catastrophic. Most of us here have heard of Samson and the great things that he did. Well, we're going to talk about some of that. Over the next two weeks, we're going to focus attention on the story of Samson and prayerfully learn some things about God, his faithfulness, his grace, and his working with humanity despite human tendencies to be wandering. Well, Today we're going to focus on the first part of this. I think it's important for us to look at the call, at the call of Samson and the, and the birth of Samson. So would you turn with me in your Bibles? Our text this morning is Judges chapter 13. And I'll be reading starting with verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless. Unable to give birth, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you do not drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You'll become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You'll become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband, Manoah, was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what will be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or any other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, 
We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with a grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife were watching. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended into the flame, in the flame. And seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, the Lord, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all of these things he now told us. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Manadan between Zorah and Eshtel. So we look at this opening introduction to this judge to come named Samson. Because of the disobedience of Israel, they were handed over to Philistine oppression. And the people, as always, once the oppressors began to press them and they began to suffer, they cried out to the Lord and God heard their cries. He decided to have mercy on them yet again and come to their rescue. And God handpicked a man to be born from the tribe of Dan into the family of a man named Manoah and his wife. And they lived in a place called Zorah, a town that was approximately... 22 and a half kilometers from Jerusalem, between Jerusalem, almost dead in the middle of the land between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea, right on the border country where the Philistines had their, their, their major cities. We see a lot of that coming to, we see a lot about the battles and things that happened along the way with King David and the Philistines. And Well, Samson was right in there, right on the territory border between the Israelites and the Philistines. At that time, we're told that Manoah and his wife weren't able to have children. It doesn't tell us why they weren't able to have children, but I I find it very interesting that God, again, chooses a childless couple to bring his next um, man that he wants to use for his purposes into the world. You see, like, like Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, and Rachel, the wife of Jacob, Manoah and his wife followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Rachel, Manoah and his wife were to receive a supernatural blessing from God in the form of a son who would become a famous leader, accomplishing great things in their nation. And this also foreshadows another great leader who would come, born in a little stable in Bethlehem, thousands of years later. Now, this right here, God's trying to speak to us about something with this story. It was God who allowed the parents of these special children to clearly understand that great things would happen through their son. But he wanted to make it crystal clear, and I think the reason why God sometimes did this, where he gave childless couples a son of promise, is because they were going to be doing some great things. And I think God wanted everyone to understand 
that it wasn't because they were doing something extra special or extraordinary that they had such a wonderful son used of God. No, this was a sign that it was God that was going to do the work, and in his sovereignty, he chose to work in this circumstance through them and through their son. There's no denying the fact that God handpicked Manoah and his wife to help raise this boy. And this is why they were visited by the angel of the Lord. See, oftentimes in biblical history in the Old Testament, when something significant was to take place and God wanted to emphasize the significance of the thing that was going to take place, there was times where God, the angel of the Lord came to the people to talk to them, to share with them what they were to do, how, what he was going to do. By angel, we're not talking about a messenger of God like Michael or Gabriel. It's an English word, angel. The Bible was not written in English. Angel of the Lord does not refer to angel as we understand like Gabriel or Michael, who bring a heralded message from, from the Lord and the message had come from God. No. As I've mentioned to you in a message recently, the appearance of God to human beings in what appeared to be a human form is what we refer to as a theophany. And um, I, I really am strongly convinced that it's actually a Christophany. The angel of the Lord typically appeared to people during the time of crisis in their lives or in their nations. And in most instances, these characters played a major role in God's plan of salvation or pointing um, towards his ultimate plan of salvation through Jesus. Usually the people didn't realize right away that they were actually talking to divinity. They were talking to God. Manoah's wife understood the person speaking to her as a man of God who appeared to be like an angel. He was awesome. Like he, he was not your ordinary Joe. This was a very distinct person to her and he appeared to be an angel. The man of God told her that he was going to have, she was going to have a son who was to be set apart as a Nazarite from birth. God would use her son to take the lead in delivering Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. It was just a start, but he would take the lead in this. For us in our culture, the Nazarite vow is a foreign concept. Does anyone really understand what a Nazarite vow is and why it was? Most of us don't. Maybe if you're a Bible scholar or you've studied a lot, you might understand this, but the common person doesn't understand what a Nazarite is. You see, the Nazarite vow was taken by some for their entire lives, such as people like Sam, uh, Samuel, like Samson, who we're talking about here, and also John the Baptist was a Nazarite from birth, to others taking it only for a season of life in a similar fashion to like fasting. People would take a Nazarite vow to consecrate their lives for a season completely to the service of the Lord. There's different scriptures that talk about that, but we're not going to get into that this morning. But Nazarites were under a special vow of God, uh, to God. And the vow that they took was to refrain from the carnal nature, thus showing the people generally that, they desired to receive, that if they desired to receive God's blessing, they must deny themselves and govern themselves faithfully towards the Lord. And this meant taking it seriously. They were to be consecrated for service to God. And there are three characteristics that, that uh, characterize the Nazarite's life. The, the first thing is that they were to abstain from wine. And uh, this prohibition was not just wine, but all grape products, including raisins and grape juice. 
And, and by refraining from this wine, the Nazarite was to demonstrate self-control and a heightened focus on, on spiritual journey. And, and the second thing they were supposed to do is avoid contact with the dead. The Nazarite must not come into contact with dead bodies. Um, and that meant even if their siblings or mother or father died, they weren't to have any contact with dead bodies. And it was also um, emphasizing the sanctity of life, I believe, and, and, and the importance of be, being spiritually pure. It was a, it was a, a symbol, an outward expression that identified an inward consecration, a bowing of the knee, you might say, to the, to the sovereign power of God, and saying, Lord, I will just, I will, I will do this in honor of you because I take it seriously and I want you to have your way in and through me. And, and the third thing was, they were never to cut their hair. Hippies rejoice. <laughs> no. The Nazarites were the first hippies. <laughs> They were never to cut their hair, allowing one's hair to grow untouched, untouched by, human, uh, by human hands. Okay? It is a visible sign of the commitment of the Nazarite to allowing God to have complete reign and not interfering with anything that God wanted to do in and through them. It was, a, it was also a symbol of consecration. And, and when they cut their hair, it was a significant event because it, it signified the conclusion of the vow. Now, a Nazarite that had hair growing from birth okay, would, would maintain that if they were consecrated to the Lord for life. They'd maintain long hair all the way through their lives and they would not cut their hair. People that had taken a Nazarite vow as in a season to show the God that they were serious about serving him and, and doing his will. They did that, and when they cut their hair, that was a sign that their vow was, was completed, that they're, they were compl concluding there. So Samson's parents were instructed to raise Samson as a Nazarite because he was to be set apart for service to the Lord. And the implication was that the boy was so, to be so completely consecrated to God that his mother even had to refrain from these things while he was still in the womb. This speaks actually about the fact that a human being is alive in their mother's womb, right? It's a human being in there. She consecrated herself to keep Nazarite vows while she was pregnant with Samson. Like other instances in the past, such as with Abraham and Jacob, um, Manoah and his wife were visited by God. By God in personal, physical form. A hint of this was given when the angel of the Lord told Manoah that he, would have dinner with, he wouldn't have dinner with them, but would rather that they offer a burnt offering to the Lord. And when Manoah asked the angel of the Lord what his name was, the angel Lord of the Lord asked why he would ask his name. Why would you ask that, Manoah? Because my name is beyond understanding. The encounter is very similar to what we see in the burning bush experience that Moses had, where God appeared to him in the burning bush. Moses asked God who he should say when he was talking to God from the burning bush. The Lord said, take your sandals off for you're standing on holy ground. And, and, and when Moses said, well, who should I say has sent me? God's came, voice came from the bush telling Moses that he should say, I am that I am sent you. Say, Tell them that I am is sending you. A particular interest. And this is tying the scriptures together through the centuries when Jesus was speaking about his identity to the Pharisees and the scribes, they were asking who he was, and they were bragging to him that they were the children of Israel, they were the children of Abraham. Jesus told them in response to this in John 8, 5, 56 to 58, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in stating this, 
Jesus was saying to them that he is the one whose name cannot be described. He is the great I am. From the beginning of the foundations of the world, he was and is still today, and he is to come. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. And when Manoah offered the burnt offering to God, the angel of the Lord suddenly ascended into the flame towards heaven. And when Manoah saw this happen, he was terrified because up to this point he had not understood that he was speaking with God. When Manoah saw this happen, the angel of the Lord ascending into the flame, suddenly it occurred to him that he had just seen God face to face. And Manoah was familiar with the law of Moses and what happened when God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 13, 19 to 21, when Moses was with, with God on the mountain and he wanted to see the glory of God. Exodus 33, 19 and 20 says, And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. God the Father lives in unapproachable glory to the point where if we saw him in his glory, if we saw his face here right now, all of us would be struck dead instantly. The power of God, the Father, in its brilliance and radiance would kill us. We couldn't contain his presence like that. We couldn't. So... What Manoah didn't realize was that the person who had told Moses this was God the Father. But what is this? The angel of the Lord. Indeed, the angel of the Lord was fully God. But God showed himself to them in a way that they would not be undone. That they would not die. You see, I believe that God, when he visited those Old Testament saints as the angel of the Lord, it was actually our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. This angel of the Lord, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, appeared to this, this, this man and his wife. And he was pleased with the sacrifice of the goat that they offered, and he ascended with the smoke in the flame. And Noah was like, ah, we're toast because he knew the law of Moses. And his wife's like, no. There's something at work here, Manoah. There is a grace that's at work here. God would have killed us if he would have wanted to, if that would have been his plan. But he didn't do this to kill us. He did this to show us what was to come, what was going to be taking place. He has a purpose and we're going to be used by him to bring this boy into the world, and he's going to be a judge of the Lord. I'm sure that's what they must have talked about. In Colossians chapter 1, you see, 15 and 16, talks to us about Jesus. You see, the angel of the Lord wasn't just partly God. No, the angel of the Lord was God. See, Jesus is not just partly God. Jesus is God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. One. Jesus showed himself to them in his pre-incarnate form because he wanted to show them his grace 
He was responding to the cries of Israel to be delivered from the Philistine oppression, even though the Philistine oppression was brought on them by their own sin and and their own disobedient actions. He still loved them and still had mercy. This is our Savior. And the scriptures tell us that God is love. Well, I'll tell you something. We don't understand the love of God the way that we really should. Prayerfully, we grow in that understanding because the more we grow to understand the love of God, the more we understand His grace and how we don't deserve it, but how He gives it freely because of His love. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, 15 and 16, the Son of God, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And if you're here and you have a Jehovah Witness background, please pay attention to this. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This was a difficult principle for the disciples to learn. And it's difficult for us to grasp all this today ourselves. Like, when I say this, some of this stuff is pretty amazing and it's hard to wrap your head around it. You know, the knowledge of God is deeper than our knowledge. We only understand so much. The knowledge of God is higher than we are. Even as the heavens are higher than the earth, so is God and all his beauty and and power and authority and, and wonder and his love even is beyond comprehension. We can grasp only a smidgen of what he is through what he reveals to us. In Jesus, in Jesus, when he was with his disciples, the disciples had a hard time with this too. You're like, oh, Philip says, well, you know, Jesus, show us the Father. And that's, so that'll be enough for us. In response to this question, Jesus told Philip in John 14, 9, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus and the Father are one. Different person, same God. So Jesus supernaturally appearing to Samson's parents and healing them from their infertility was an indication that he was going to do something great. That's what he was going to do because it was his sovereign will to do so through Samson. Despite Samson's natural human frailty and the propensity of humanity to wander from God in their spirits. God had a plan. He had prepared a unique destiny for Samson Despite the fact that Samson, man, he had problems. See, there are deep spiritual lessons. We're going to get into it. I'm not going to get into it all this week, but I do want to speak to a couple of things because it's really important for us to understand something here. There's deep spiritual lessons for us in the story of Samson and the stories of the other judges that we go go through. Pardon me. Samson, I believe in particular, was the living example of a man who was like the nation of Israel. He was going to act out in person what Israel was acting out as a nation. How Israel acted as a nation, in turn, is how the rest of humanity acts towards God when the unbridled nature of our sinful man is permitted to run its course. As it's written in Jeremiah Chapter 17, 5 and 6, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws his strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the living God. Turns away from the Lord, sorry. Rather. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in salt land where no one lives. Now, you know, there's probably some here going, well, when are we going to get into the great things that Samson did? For, for many kids, including myself, who've grown up in the church, we've read the stories in the Bible about Samson, and he's kind of like a Marvel superhero, isn't he? 
And next week, we're going to talk some more about what he did. And with superhuman strength, we see he killed a lion with his bare hands. He lifted a giant city gate off its hinges and packed it away. And hand-to-hand combat, he was unbeatable. He killed a thousand men who were attacking him armed only with a jawbone of a donkey. And in his death, even, he toppled the giant marble pillars of the temple of the Philistines. So physically, Samson was spectacular, a specimen of human strength. We're told that there is never a man in history as strong physically as Samson was. He was a man's man and a warrior and a military hero to countless boys throughout the ages. But in character, Samson was to exemplify how a man with great God-given talents and abilities was so incredibly spiritually weak when it came to standing on his own strength. As we see the story of Samson unfold, we see the sad reality of sin's imprint on the human heart. And as I just read from Jeremiah there, just brings that in. You see, along with achieving victory in a physical sense, the story of Samson is also a very sad story of pride, disobedience, and sinful relationships with women. But it's also a story of how God takes brokenness and disobedience, and despite all of that, he still works it through to accomplish his purposes. Thankfully, because of his merciful nature, He gives us grace that we don't deserve. He works his purposes out in people. People like Samson. People like you and me. God takes brokenness and disobedience and does something with it. Thankfully, the example to us given in Judges is that God doesn't wait till we all clean up our lives before He decides to call us. He calls us. And he hears the cries of our hearts. And he knows that along the way, there might be some bumpy patches before we come to a point where he has his way in and through us. Now, the life of Samson illustrates how the very best of man is not good enough to stay even keeled with God. You can have the most talent of anyone in the world. You can be the best at whatever you do. You can rise to the top. You can be a superstar You can be a giant of a man or a woman with incredible talent. But you can't stay on course. It's not in you to stay on course. Why? Because of sin. The greatest, strongest man that ever lived. We're going to talk about the tragedy of his life next Sunday. See, Samson illustrated, just like Israel illustrated, that you're not going to come to being even keeled and being righteous through the old covenant law. The law was given to show us what was right and what was wrong. But the law shows us That we need a Savior. Galatians 3 21 25 says, The law therefore is opposed to the is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For the law had been given that could impart life. If the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. 
Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now this faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. You see, God was able to work out the formula that humanity needed. What we're seeing in the scriptures is the, is the snapshots leading to the cross. Everything in the Old Testament points to the need for a savior because man in his own wisdom, in his own strength, in his own beauty, in his own talents cannot do the right thing. We need a savior. One who will rescue us because we're depraved in our sinful natures and we need salvation. The reason why the world needs a savior is because it's lost. The world can't pull itself up doesn't matter who's in charge. The world cannot do the right things. You can't do the right thing. You can try all you want. You might be given all the talent that you want, but you're not going to do the right thing. Your life is not going to be even killed until you come to the point where you need, you see your need for a Savior, one who will rescue you. And the angel of the Lord sees your need. And the angel of the Lord fulfilled his promise to Israel through the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord came down to the world that was broken. And he came to completely save us from our sins and our spiritual enemies in the way that the judges of the Bible like Samson and the nation of Israel couldn't do They were to be an ambassador nation for the Lord, but they fell far short because they couldn't do it within themselves. Their hearts are hearts, people. You try to walk your faith out in your own strength, you're going to fall down. You're going to bang your head against the cement. You're not going to make it. You can't do it. You're not good enough to do it. Like all other, there's other religions in the world that say, oh, I'm... The divine is in me, is me. I am the divine. You know, the, the greatest revelation of Hinduism, for instance, is that I am God. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's, that's what the lie of the serpent was in the Garden of Eden. The devil wants you to believe that. You can't make it on your own. You need a savior. And the sooner you realize that, the better it's going to be. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. And everything in this book that we're talking about in Judges points to the cross. And everything past that point in the New Testament points back to the cross. The center focus is the great I am. The one who was and is and is to come. We live him. We live for him. He created this world and he created us. And he created it for him. Oh, people. The sooner we understand the love of God... And that he created everything for himself. But because of his character, he's not like us. He doesn't go, oh, I think I'll take advantage of that scenario and, you know, and, and be cruel. That's not God. No. The king of glory became a servant. The angel of the Lord humbled himself and became obedient to a cross. And he died for you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You can't be the master of your sin nature. Only God can do that. But coming to the cross is the starting point because that's where you receive the Spirit of God who enables you to be an overcomer. God doesn't desire you to swim around in a pool of disobedience. He wants you to be free in Jesus this morning. You can be free. And he who the sun sets free, he is free indeed. Amen.